Hello my friends and fellow collectors, hope you're all well and virus free. Um, right, today um, today's quite a, a nostalgic uh, video for me because, let me explain, um, from the time I was about 13 years of age, which would be 1961, um, to around 1983 when I was 35 years of age, um, all I did was read science fiction, um, apart from comics, which I've always read. But that was that was my main main hobby. Any spare time I had, I read science fiction. Nothing else, just science fiction. Um, so today, I'm going to be showing you my collection of vintage science fiction paperbacks, um, <clears throat> and and a lot of these are. Well, all of these are the original books I bought. Um, the collection is, you know, it's it's reasonably extensive now, but it was more so, uh, say, 30 years ago. But uh, I've had to pare it down over the years to just to keep things sane and sensible. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to show you um, vintage paperbacks, some of them from 50 or 50 or more years ago. Um, and they're... they're what we're covering today, the novels. Um, just briefly, there are, there are three kinds of science fiction uh, paperback books. There are the novels, there are the collections of short stories by the same author, and then there are anthologies, which are the same as the collections, except that they're by, by different authors. So a prime example of an anthology would be all of the prize-winning novels will be collected into one, um, one anthology um, by different authors. Now to give you give you some context of, of where where science fiction paperbacks would come uh, in, in in sort of like the the area of collecting, I'll just give you a very very quick uh, crash course in how publishing worked for science fiction authors back in the sixties seventies, um, probably still does, but of course science fiction is not as popular as it used to be. But um, basically, <coughs> science fiction authors would would write, we'll, we'll take short stories for instance, um, science fiction authors would write their short stories and they would then send them off to one of the pulp magazines. Um, these, these, were the, these were the sort of like an example of the, the three most popular fantasy and science fiction um, galaxy magazine say and an analogue which was more more for your hard science, you know, the real hardcore stuff. Um, and when when they'd had, you know, when when the, when the good authors had had several published, um, they would then hopefully get picked up by the hardback publishers, um, who would bring out a hardback. This particular one is. Um, collection of short stories by Harlan Nellison. Um, so that that would then, the, the stories in the magazines would be what they called first publication. And then when they came out in hardback, that was the, the first, the real first edition. So that would be the one that collectors would seek. Um, and then a lot of the, a lot of the hardback publishers had their own uh, paperback imprints and so um, eventually they would they would then come out as mass market paperbacks um, for for the hardcover I mean for the magazines uh, the author would get so many cents a word uh, for a short story <clears throat> for the hardback um, they'd be you know if they were sort of like top line authors they'd be given an advance and then once that advance had been made with sales, then the author would be given a royalties, uh, so much money based on how many were sold. And then, of course, when the mass mass paperback came out, um, then they would get, get royalties based on the number of paperbacks sold. Now, um, in, some, in some instances, the real first edition would be the paperback because um, the, 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 the stories might not get big, picked up by a hardware house, uh, sorry, a hardware, a hardcover house, and, and, the, and the stories might go straight to paperback. 
So then the paperback becomes the first proper uh, proper uh, edition, proper first edition, if you like. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but uh, yeah, I'm probably making it sound more complicated than it is. Um, and then with with novels, um, some magazines, some of the pulp magazines serialised novels like some of Frank Herbert's June novels were were serialised over a few months and then <clears throat> the same process it would then go to the hardback to become the first proper edition and then to paperback to become the first paperback edition but as I say the, the ones that the collectors sought were the first hardback edition or if there was no hardback, the first paperback edition. Those are the ones that collectors sort of went after. So um, that gives you a rough idea of... <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice already. Give you a rough idea of how publishing worked for these authors. Now, everything I'm going to show you today is, is in paperback and I'm covering the novels only. Now, the good thing about a lot of these... These are all in alphabetical order, by the way, of, of author. Now, one of the nice things about the the, the paperback is, is, is the covers were suitably garish um, and, uh, you know, very nice to look at. So, you know, that um, not only did he have the story to read, he had a very nice cover to look at as well. Um, this is Brian Aldiss, uh, well-respected British author. Um, Non-stop is a, sort of like a generational... Um, Starship, like the film Passengers, if you've seen it. Um, I won't, I won't linger too long on on each, because I've got a few to get through. But I'll just uh, run through them and, and just show you them, really. And there's Brian Aldiss again, Frankenstein Unbound, which is a well, well thought of um, science fiction novel. Um, then we had Barefoot in the Head now. This is this is round about when um, science fiction went a bit bonkers in the UK. Um, um, we had people like Michael Moorcock uh, heading up what they called the New Wave. It was a, it was a different kind of science fiction novel. It was more um, dystopian, if you like, rather than the utopian stuff that had come before with Isaac Asimov and people like this. And uh, that was Brian Aldiss's contribution to the to the new wave in the seventies. Um, talking of Asimov, that's um, that's one of his more famous novels, The Gods Themselves. Of course, Asimov was the man who invented the three laws of robotics, which everybody lives by these days, from um, movies to. To, uh, I, d I don't have any of the um, of the robot books, sadly, but um, I'll probably get round to it. Um, right, J.G. Ballard, that was another well-respected British author. He, he was kind of more of a new wave person, uh, Concrete Island. It's about, about a bloke who's trapped on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an island in the middle of a motorway. I haven't read that particular one, but it uh, sounds interesting. Um, that's High Rise, which they made into a film, which I saw with Michael Fassbender, I believe, was in it. Um, that what goes on in a in a high rise building that gets locked down, I believe. Yeah, High Rise is a modern fable, a commentary on the hideous possibilities of advanced technology. Well, we heard that one before. And uh, right now, this is a this is a brilliant novel, Gregory Benford's Timescape. Um, it's basically a time travel novel. It's about people in the future trying to send a message back to us in in the in the current day or the current day as it was when this was written <coughs> to warn us of uh, something that's going to happen that we should try and avoid. It's uh, it's quite a complex. A novel in these time travel novels always do my head in anyway so but uh, yeah that is uh, um, if you can get hold of a copy of that the library or something I mean science fiction's hard to find now it's all fantasy but if you can find a copy in the library 
Uh, that's a well, a very well respected novel, The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. Uh, interesting cover there. Um, I read it a long time ago and I'm starting to remember exactly what happened, but um, it's, uh, it's a well thought of novel and that was another one of his great novels, The Stars by Destination. I uh, introduced the character Gully Foyle, <coughs> who was um, quite a notable in science fiction circles. Like I say, I can't speak too, too long about these because we've got quite a lot to get through. Um, <coughs> right, Ray Bradbury. I think everybody knows this one, don't they? Fahrenheit 451, where, where books are not allowed anymore, they'll get burned. Fahrenheit 451 is the temperature at which paper burns. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean it's, it's thought, I thought to be one of Bray Bradbury's best, but I, I've got a couple of his novels that I would put above that. But, um, yeah, uh, that's one of them, Martian Chronicles. That's more a series of short stories that are hung together as a as a novel, they call it a uh, fix-up in the in the public publishing trade, where they bind a lot of short stories that have some sort of thread or connection running through it and make it into a novel. Uh, that is one such, and uh, an excellent read it is too. They did a TV series with Rock Hudson uh, way way back in the day, the eighties, I believe. Um, Right, so uh, John Brunner, there is another one of our, our English, uh, British New Wave authors, Stand on Zanzi, but a lot of his stuff was quite dystopian, it warned us about, um, well, much like, you know, global warming, stuff like that, <coughs> way back in the day, back, back in the 70s, 80s, whenever this was uh, printed, an interesting cover. Um... Yeah, it's more or less about overcrowding that one on the planet. But um, yeah, he was he was well respected author. And then the sheep look up. That's uh, I think that's fairly obvious from the cover. We're looking at the uh, pandemic pandemic situation with that one. I think. Um, just satire apparently, but a lot of science fiction is. And then we have <clears throat> Shockwave Rider, another one that was well received. Um, that's more about computers and um, modern science. But, um, yeah. And then we have, all right, we move on to, <coughs> this is quite an interesting novel. It's, um, who by Algis Budris. This has been made into a film also. Um, it's about a, <coughs> an English spy that comes back from Russia. And he's, um, he's been blown up or something and he's got this sort of, as you can see, this false head and arm and of course you can't recognise him. Um, and it's all about uh, finding out is he, is he the guy that went or is he a Russian mole? Um, that's been sent in his place. Um, yeah, the film was quite good as well. I don't know if they called it the same thing or whether it had a different title, but um, yeah, that one was by a guy called Algis Budris, who's not one of the sort of like foremost science fiction lights. Now, this one is, um, this is quite, um, I wouldn't say it's a scarce book, but it's a hard one to find at a decent price. Um, David R. Bunch, Moderan. It's about, it, it's, it's quite relevant to modern society. This one is about people who have uh, robotic parts fitted to themselves and it's, it's, um, it's kind of um, a race to get as many parts on you as possible. Uh, that's your status symbol. The more robotic parts you have, much like, you know, we do these days with plastic surgery and whatever, you, rubber lips and all of that stuff. So, yeah. That's one of my, that's one of my favourites. Right, now we come on to one of the, one of the giants, Arthur C. Clarke, um, 
childhoods, childhood's end. That's just about alien invasion, that one, which um, is quite a, a common theme. Um, Rama, <coughs> Monivu with Rama is one of his probably most famous novels. Um, it's about a, a ship that comes, orbits the Earth, and <coughs> the, the astronauts have to go and find out what its secrets are. Good read. Good read, Rendezvous with Rama. Um, and songs of Distant Earth. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's another generation ship uh, novel. You know, so you put people to sleep and they trot off to some utopia or so they hope. Um, not one of his major works, but um, interesting for all that. Okay. Uh, D.G. Compton on Sleeping Eye. Now this was made into a film. Um, I forget what they called it. Um, I know there was an alternative title to the book. It was the something. Uh, Catherine Morton Ho, the, the hero of the book. Um, but yeah, that, um, it's um, it's basically about um, someone who's going to die, and uh, they they put it on. Put it on TV for viewers to to watch, you know, in Big Brother style. Um, I did it a long time ago, so it was quite prophetic for its time, but more relevant uh, these days. Um, right, here we one of these ace <coughs> ace books. Um, it was smaller than smaller than your average book, um, and. Yeah, a lot, a lot of those books were just like space operas. They weren't very, weren't very high brow. But this particular one, Samuel Delaney, he's more of a, I don't know, he, he writes very high brow stuff. So I don't know what that ended up doing in, in those books. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't read that one in particular. But um, I just thought I'd, I'd keep it because he's an interesting author. Um, this was one of his more famous books, Dahlgren, um, about an alien planet. World has gone mad, society has perished, savagery rules. Mm -hmm. The dying days of Earth, there you go. All very dystopian, but um, yeah. Right, now we come on to the, on to the good stuff, Philip K. Dick. Oh man, this this guy wrote some weird stuff, but he wrote a lot of good stuff as well. Of course, you know, well famous for his his novelette that was turned into Blade Runner. Do androids dream of electric sheep? <coughs> was the title of the novelette originally? Quite different from the film, but uh, that's where they got it from. Um, this. Is one of his pot boilers. Philip K. Dick wrote a lot of interesting books, some of them more interesting than others. Um, so I'll just run through them. It's another ace book. That's one of the, the larger format, our friends from Frolix 8. Um, Martian time slip now. Um, I, I believe this is one of the. I'll just check the. Um, this season, this one, I think. I think maybe I might be wrong here, but I think that was possibly an original um, first edition. Uh, it didn't. I don't think it went to hardback. But um, if, if I'm right in that, then these these first editions, proper first editions in paperback, especially by somebody like Dick, quite expensive now. Be a Ballantine book as well. Um, um, then we have, I get most of Philip K. Dick's books because, um, the ultimate truth, because uh, they're always good to read. Um, yeah, big, an interesting cover. I say a lot of the joy of these books is, is, is in the covers, there's some great, uh, there's some great stuff. Uh, more Dick. Now wait for last year. Time travel jobby. Um, we can build you. Um, yeah, this was these door books were a series of 
science fiction books that came out. There again, like the Ace books, a lot of the stuff was pretty lowbrow, but uh, this one wasn't. We Can Build You by Philip K. Dick. Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember. I know it's. Um, I know it's the reference for a film or a TV series. I can't remember which one exactly, but anyway. And that's, although that's, uh, you see, you got a, that says first time in paperback. Doesn't mean it's a first edition. Uh, it would have had a hardback, which is the true first edition. Flow my tears, the policeman said. Another door book, and we have these, uh, these, these ace books early. These are very early books. These are like early 60s, late 50s. Um, there again, they're just pot boilers, really. They're, they're nothing startling. Another ace game player, Titan. Um, just interesting to look at, really. Another ace book. Simulacra and Clans of the Alpha. I mean, I see, I mean, these are not, not major dick novels, they're just <coughs> pop boy and a space opera type of things. Lots of blood money. I think that one's a bit more expensive. But so a lot of these are now because, as I say, they're 50, 60 years old, so I'm <coughs> Philip K. Dick, Cracking Space. And of course, this one, Scanner Darkly, that was made into a film with uh, Keanu Reeves. Can't remember who else was it from Downey. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> might, might be association there uh, with Robert, but um, yeah, that was one of his uh, more interesting efforts about drugs, of course, which uh, he was very much into. Right, another one of our fine. British authors uh, for Thomas Dish, The Genocides. Quite a gruesome looking cover there. These, because of these, um, Panther will be an English uh, reprint. And Camp Concentration, which was quite a well thought of book. by Thomas Dish. I haven't actually read that one so I couldn't tell you much about it even if I had time. Um, oh, Wings of Song. America, a generation and from now not as it should be but as it will be. <laughs> Superhero by the look of him. Or an ordinary bloke with the ability to fly. Let's get around to reading it sometime. Okay, now, here's another author who very, very well regarded in science fiction circles. Um, like Dick, the quality of his books varies, but by and large, most of them are interesting. Philip Jose Farmer, Strange Relations. And The Green Odyssey. Um, I think... Um, I think a few of these I'm going to show you will be. Oh, that one's um, that one's actually a, a signed copy, which which makes it more desirable. Um, and I have a feeling that that's probably a proper first edition, so that will be hard to come by at a decent price. Okay. Yeah, that was one of his. One of his books that he wrote as uh, Kilgore Trout, which is his nom de plume. Um, yeah. And, sorry, I'm getting myself muddled up here. Um, Dare. I believe that's another uh, first, first edition, proper first edition. I don't think that had a hardback. Um, 
Yeah, it says, it's not one I've read, so I'm not familiar with it. But there's the name of a planet, apparently. Okay, moving on. Um, Philip Jose Farmer, Traitor to the Living. And yeah, well, image of the beast now. Um, <coughs> this is an, an, an exorcism ritual one up there. Um, Philip Jose Farmer wrote a few um, sort of semi-porn uh, science fiction novels and I think that's one of them. Um, it's about a private eye apparently. But, um, yeah, that, was the, that was the second until that didn't say so, as it does. An exorcism ritual to learn. You can probably tell by the cover what sort of material to expect inside, but uh, yeah, he wrote a few of those. Right, now this is probably his, um, his sort of like his Piazza de Resistance, uh, the Riverworld series. To your scattered bodies go. Uh, that's a first paperback, it's not a real first edition, but it's a first paperback by Barclay Books. A lot of these are American that I've got here. Um, and that was the next one, the fabulous river boat, river world novel. And strangely named Jesus on Mars. Uh, just another one of his pot boilers, nothing amazing about it. As with the unreasoning mask, Philip as a farmer. And this is quite an interesting one, uh, Day World. This is the one where, where people are only where people are put to sleep because they're overcrowded and um, they're only allowed to come round every Tuesday or every Thursday or something, uh, as I remember. So you only had people walking around for one seventh of the time, which apparently is the is the uh, drain on resources. So you can only watch telly one day a week. Unlucky. Right, uh, the man who folded himself. I think that's a some sort of uh, time travel. Yeah, David Gerald. I normally keep all time travel books because. Uh, I like the subject, although he's not one of the top tier of authors, David Gerald, when Harley was one. Another one of Gerald's, uh, oh, I've not read that one, so I don't know what it's about. Um, yeah, Forever World, Joe Hordeman, that's self-explanatory. Uh, it's a military type of book that, about the Forever War. One, one I think, the Hugo Award, uh, so... There's something good about it. This is a book that's um, it's well respected in science fiction circles, The Rails by Charles Harmis. Not a prolific author by any means, but um, it's an ultimate confrontation between science and art. There you go. I'll say it's well. Right, now we come to one of the giants, uh, Robert Heinlein. Starship Troopers. Uh, I've seen this advertised as a juvenile novel, but I wouldn't have thought so. But um, yeah, just about infantrymen of the future, apparently. And his grand work, his magnus opus, magnum opus, Stranger in a Strange Land, uh, about a Martian who comes to earth as I remember. Yeah, the story of Valentine Michael Smith, born and educated on Mars, ignorant of everything that we know. So, yeah, okay. Now we have one of my particular favourite novels. That's, um, I've, got a, I've got an English version of this which I like even more, but that's a nice, a nice version of it. 
when I said I used to do a lot of pot boilers and lowbrow, uh, certainly <laughs> that's neither. <laughs> that is one. That is one brilliant book. Um, I would recommend mean, anybody to read that. I think get hold of it. June. It's about the planet Arrakis, um, where spice is um, the currency made by sandworms, which threaten the populace, and it's about um, two families warring for control made into a film and I think there's a film coming up uh, June Messiah that was a one of the sequels and Children of June yeah climax, that must have been the second one this is the climax of the June trilogy Children of June I know that came out as a as a serial in one of the pulp magazines so I've got it right. Um, I think I kept that one just got like the cover to be honest. <laughs> um, it just looked interesting, and I believe it's a, I believe it's a proper first edition as well. So, Legend of Mary by Zach Hughes. I don't know of anything else he's written actually. Um, Devil is Dead by R.A. Lavery. This this guy wrote a lot of um, non-serious science fiction. Uh, I just kept it because it's funny. Interesting cover. Um, right now, dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin. Um, I was lucky enough to meet this lady um, when I lived in London. She, I went to a, a science fiction class. It was it was non-vocational, but um, yeah, we we just sat around and talked about books. And she came to a lecture to us um, once, and she was very very kind enough to sign it for me also uh, that makes it a bit more desirable um yeah tale of two worlds it's um it's uh, spelled by the story of Shevet, a brilliant physicist who single-handedly attempts to reunite two planets cut off from each other by centuries of distrust better than i could have uh, summed it up even though i have read it Okay, Fritz Lieber is another one of our, our giants. Um, wrote a lot of fantasy stuff as well, um, but um, yeah, that was one of his uh, one of his novels, The Wanderer. Not a very interesting cover, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that was an award-winning novel which I kept just for that uh, fact alone. Von der McIntyre, I think she died uh, recently. Snake. Um, right, I have to whiz through these because we're right. This is Michael Moorcock. Behold the man. This is um, Carl Glogow was one of his recurring characters, and uh, this is a religious book which you might have heard of. And Breakfast in the Ruins was the the other book with Glogow in. Right? Uh, these are these are all British um, printings, by the way. The final program that's Jerry Cornelius. <coughs> he's, he's the most recurring <coughs> of, of Michael Moorcock characters. Um, yeah, I could never get away with with the Jerry Cornelius books, but I have them nevertheless because I like Moorcock, English assassin. Um, another Cornelius book, and then. Here for cancer, yet another and condition of music, another nice cover. And then the lives and times of said Jerry Cornelius. And so I've tried to read them, but I find them a bit obscure. All <coughs> right, Ring World by Navi Larry Niven, that's um. One of these hard science uh, novels uh, about the ring world. And uh, that's a uh, return to the ring world. Look at these, these books once won awards. Um, Frederick Polman plus about the evolution of man basically. He travels out to the 
the planets as I remember. How man evolves <coughs> because of his um, planetary travels. Uh, Frederick Pohl is another well respected author who won a lot of prizes. Gateway. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, similar to the Ring World. Um, beyond the Blue Event Horizon, that's obviously a, a time travel. And the Star Dance by Spider and Jan Robinson. Husband and wife team. Uh, she was the world's greatest dancer but could never dance on Earth. I read that one, so I don't know. Right, a female man, that's a very, very popular science fiction novel. Um, Joanna Russ is a feminist. And that's, yeah, well, I think it's probably self-explanatory. I won't babble on too much now because um, this video is getting on a bit. Right, Fred Saberhagen. Berserker, that was a series of novels he did about rogue robots that would tear into things and destroy them. Another one about the Berserker, the ultimate enemy. Um, right. Introduces slow glass, um, which is a, a weird concept in science fiction. And then Robert Sheckley, he's um, he, he writes more satirical stuff. Right, what have we got now? More, more Sheckley. Right, well, we'll bomb through because. Um, Again, I mentioned miracles. All right, Robert Silverberg, another one of our giants. Time of changes. And up the line. Downward to the earth. Man. Going inside. Uh, it's a certificate novel by Norman Spinrad, The Iron Dream. I think it's a satire on Nazi Germany, as I remember. Uh, Bug Jack Barron, that was an interesting novel about media. Uh, there again, I think that was turned into either a film or a television. Uh, these are all Norman Spinrad, Songs from the Stars. Don't know about that, I haven't read it. <coughs> and James Tiptree, he's another satirical writer, The Wars of the World. Um, it's another one of these hard science. Fire Kai hotline, you have to be careful how you say that. We're late, the sweet birds sang Kate Wilhelm. Another award winning book I kept for that reason. Uh, the wife of Damon Knight, who was a very, <coughs> very large figure in the science fiction circle, especially for his anthologies and stuff. And Gene Wolfe, fifth head of Cerberus. Uh, Roger Zelazny. Sounds as if you're off cut when you say that. Zelazny. <coughs> Immortal. Uh, Lord of Light. That's more a fantasy novel, Jack of Shadows. Nice cover. My name is 
Legion. Where's the Zelazny? Oh, so. Inferno by Larry Nevin and Jerry Pornell. Moaning um, God's Eye by. So, and so these are all sort of like hard, hard signs. Now, just briefly speak about these. Their um, Ace, although I said a lot of their stuff was lowbrow, they did produce um, a series of, as you can see there, Ace Science Fiction Special at the top there. Um, there were 38 of these, and I have 37 of them. I'm missing um, Alessia Le Guin. Um, I can't remember the name of the title, but I'm missing it anyway. But uh, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to get it to complete the set. But yeah, this was a series that was brought out um, with with higher writing standards, or so the editor said. And I went through them very quickly. Why call them back from heaven by Clifford Simak? Which is Carrots by James Smith. A lot of these had. Um, Covers by Leo and Diane Dillon, who uh, are very famous in in science fiction art circles. Past Master by R.A. Lafferty. Revolving Boy, Gertrude Freiberg. Lincoln Hunters, Wilson Tucker. As I say, a lot of these are quite scarce now. Um, Obviously, people collected them as a set. Anna Russ, Picnic on Paradise. Other things fell apart on Gulat. And I'm sure the two timers. Right, stretch it over a bit. Follow these. Um, Joy, E.G. Compton, The Ring, Piers Anthony. Curse Died by Joanna Russ. I say this is a full set bar one. Uh, you know, I don't remember the name of the person that Queen Lovell that I'm missing. Philip K. Dick, Reserving Machine. Stephen Breed, James Schmitz. Down Under Earth, Avram Davidson. Chasm, John Sladek. Son of Altitude, D.G. Compton. Bob Shaw, um, Keith Roberts, Jack Orbit, John Brunner. So I, think I like these covers by the Dillons. Um, very nice, especially the bigger ones. Black Corridor by Moorcock, Michael Moorcock. Roger Zalazny again. Eye of the Dead. Uh, was mentioned by Mr. Lafferty, Steel Crocodile, D.G. Compton. If I can, if I can reach them, I'll show you the last few. Phoenix in the Mirror, Avram Davidson. Yeah, so left, left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Green is the one I'm trying to remember. That's the Wizard of Earth, see the other one she did. Yeah, Left Hand of Darkness, I must uh, get on eBay and find a copy. So I've got a full set Chronicles, D.G. Compton. And Moving Tomorrow's Bob Shaw. The one called Mickland. Of 
Furthest by Susan Hayden Elgin. Traveling Black. Well, that's more of a fantasy, I believe. You only crime. Calister. And there. Midnight Dancer, Jerry Conway. You might recognise Jerry Conway as a, as a comic writer. And. Finally, Warlord of the Air by Michael Moorcock. Okay, sorry I had to whiz through those last few, but um, if this, if this uh, goes on much longer, I'll have to cut it and edit it, and I don't want to do that. So yeah, I hope that gave, uh, gave you a rough idea of um, some of the, the nicer vintage uh, science fiction paperbacks out there. Um, next time, I'll be doing... Uh, Pickups probably for, ooh, what is it, Feb and March now? Yep, yep. So uh, anyway, keep well, everybody, and uh, I'll see you then. Bye-bye now.